It is a singular honor to introduce this special program to commemorate the life and legacy of Morena Verabenu, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, on the occasion of his first yard site. In a moment, you'll hear about some of the extraordinary contributions Rabbi Lamb made to the world of Jewish thought over the course of his lifetime. Given the breadth of those accomplishments, any attempt to circumscribe them would seem to be in vain. But in thinking about Rabbi Lamb's achievements, there is a word. There is a word that I've always found particularly resonant, a word that in some small measure characterizes his intellectual contributions to our community. And the word is synthesis, or as Rabbi Lamb sometimes called it, complementarity. He spoke and wrote often about how we ought to broaden the lens through which we see the world, to appreciate that we needn't shy away from the clash between irreconcilable perspectives. We become richer when we develop the capacity to live with tension. So it was little wonder that Rabbi Lamb could move so seamlessly between the worlds of the greatest Hasidic masters on the one hand and the great halachists on the other, that he was equally at home in the natural sciences and in the humanities, and of course, most famously, that he could integrate Torah Umada into a coherent worldview. Now, when a community chooses a rabbi, it's usually confronted with a decision. It can choose a scholar or it can choose a pastor. The former will occupy the world of ideas. He'll dazzle his members with brilliant scholarship and spectacular feats of oratory. The latter will make his mark quietly in the hospital room or at the shiva visit. He'll be a font of empathy and an ongoing source of compassion. As the rabbi of the Jewish center, Rabbi Lamb created a new paradigm. He synthesized the two great roles of the rabbi. He became the preeminent scholar of our era at the same time that he was dispensing compassion to his beloved flock. A public intellectual, there was no area of wisdom that was foreign to him. He could quote Reb Chaim of Volazhin in one breath and Immanuel Kant in the next. Mysticism and medrash, poetry and prose, all flowed lyrically from his lips. But Rabbi Lamb's intellectual achievements never came at the expense of the unending care and concern he had for the people in his life. He radiated warmth and charm. He could always find time to meet. He took an interest in matchmaking. He looked out for people who were alone or abandoned, and there was no issue too small. He once wrote a letter of consolation to a little girl grieving over the loss of her pet bird. It has become axiomatic that any tribute to Rabbi Lamb must perforce include a quotation or a paraphrase of one of his teachings. 
Inasmuch as he was the greatest orator of his generation, Rabbi Lamb can only be captured in words that were his own. We mortals, we mortals who walk in his footsteps could never dream of matching the facility of his language or the profundity of his thought. We aspire only to accurately convey the messages he taught. And so I humbly add my voice to the chorus of those who strive to transmit the Masorah of Rabbi Lamb's legacy to a waiting generation. The Talmud teaches, Ein ben David ba ad shetichla pruta min hakis. While this is usually taken to mean that the Messiah will not arrive until every last penny has been spent, Rabbi Lam once cited a Hasidic interpretation of the passage in this very sanctuary. It's not the pruta that needs to end, but the notion of pratiyut, fragmentation, the inclination toward personal and collective isolation. In its place, Rabbi Lam said, we need an orientation of klaliyut, it's the capacity to see the world in its fullness that will help usher in the Messianic age. The words that follow, spoken by four outstanding heirs to Rabbi Lamb's legacy, are intended to further this goal. For it is only with the passage of time that we can fully come to grips with the totality of what it is that we've lost. In the exploration of Rabbi Lamb's legacy, there is solace too in the promise of all we might yet find. A song and a sermon. Two very different Jews from very different backgrounds composed at around the same time profound and prescient meditations on the moral perils of modern communication. I draw on two of my recent tributes to Rabbi Lamb in commentary and in tradition in attempting to illustrate why this is so. First, the song. In 1964, a young Jewish boy from Queens rocketed to fame when his lyrics, sung by the songwriter as part of a duo, created one of the most famous phrases in the English language today. The composer was Paul Simon. The duo was Simon and Garfunkel, and the phrase was the sound of silence. Interestingly, when we actually study that song, what emerges is that it's not actually about a world in which there is no noise, but the opposite. It's about a world in which there is too much noise. The sound of silence here is not genuine silence that is heard in solitude. Rather, it refers to the lack of communication that exists in a noisy world, in a commercialized world, in a world of technology. Just look at the lyrics. And in the naked light I saw 10,000 people, maybe more, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening. To them, Simon pleads in the song, hear my words that I might teach you, take my arms that I might reach you, but my words like silent raindrops fell. By silent, Simon refers to the inability to hear the other in this world. This brings us to the sermon. At almost the very same time, on Yom Kippur in 1965, a young rabbi in a prominent New York synagogue delivered a sermon that he had titled, Divine Silence or a Human Static? The source for his oratorical inspiration was the statement in Avot that Bechol Yom Vayom Bat Kol Yotzeit Mehar Chorev, every day a heavenly voice issues forth from Mount Sinai. The question, this rabbi reflected, was obvious. If the voice of God continues to thunder forth, why is it not heard? And his answer was that if we do not hear God in today's day and age, it is not because God is not speaking, but rather because, quote, we are too busy talking. We are, he said, too involved in many other things that are inconsequential and meaningless. Our society is too wordy. We are drowned in the verbosity of our mass media of communication. Words, he said, come to us not in sentences, but in veritable torrents from mass media." End quote. Here too, his message was the same. What seems to be the sound of silence is actually the inability to hear God in the modern world. Now, of course, the author of Torah Umadah did not reject single-mindedly the achievements of modernity. Rather, 
For my lamb, the sin of our age was to refuse to seek to sanctify these achievements, to bring God into the modern world. As Rabbi Lamb put it in a separate sermon, quote, we have eaten of the tree of knowledge like no generation before us, and we have found the fruits bitter, for such is the taste of radioactive ash. We have developed science and technology at an incredible pace, yet we have become what in Jewish literature is known as wise for our own hurt. Our genius has proved an evil genius. With our increase in knowledge has come a shrinkage of wisdom. With the conquest of the universe, we have discovered that we have let our own lives lie fallow. Learning to make a living, we have forgotten how to live. Exploring outer space, we have ignored the thunderous silence of our inner space and inner void. As I wrote in commentary, to return to words such as these from the rabbi who delivered them, which is of course Rabbi Norman Lamb, is to discover homiletics as a lost art. It was in the 1980s that presidential speechwriter Peggy Noonan reflected that, quote, the irony of modern speeches is that as our ability to disseminate them has exploded, nevertheless, their quality has declined. Why, she writes, lots of reasons, including that, uh, that we as a nation no longer learn the rhythms of public utterance from Shakespeare and the Bible, end quote. At the same time, she urges the speechwriter to respect the audience by aiming higher, as she puts it, be honest and logical in your approach and they will understand every word you say and hear and know that you thought of them. Writing at almost exactly the same time as Noonan in the 80s, Rabbi Lamb, already president of Yeshiva for several years, reflected that if rabbinic rhetoric was no longer rising to the occasion, it was because, as he put it, quote, part and parcel of today's society is the loss of verbal potency. Rabbi Lamb added that drush, true drush, is, quote, a form of communication. Rhetoric demands verbal skills, and the art of homiletics, therefore, he said, suffers along with all other forms of verbal communication. Even if one is endowed with the requisite talents of imagination in interpreting a text, he lacks the skills needed to express himself, end quote. Peggy Noonan further noted that today, people look for the soundbite in the speech. The, the one phrase that will make the news. But what's missed, she adds, is that as she puts it, quote, great sound bites happen by accident, which is to say all great sound bites are yielded up inevitably as the natural expression of the text. That's what she says. And to give one example, everyone knows the last words of Lincoln's second inaugural, but they are yielded by the theology of his argument presented throughout the speech. The Civil War, Lincoln said, was God's punishment for slavery. In this crime, all America is complicit, and therefore all America has suffered. And that yields up what today would be called the soundbite, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Rabbi Lamb's sermons also contain exquisite soundbites. Learning to make a living, we have forgotten how to live. But they are an extension of the beauty and the substance of the larger message. The entire composition in every drasha was created so that he would not merely emote at his audience, but speak with them. So that for one moment, through his words, God's voice from Sinai would penetrate the human static of our modern world. I have referred to Rabbi Lam as history's greatest composer of drashot in English. By this I meant not only that he was an oratorical artist, but that he had a gift for making himself heard in this all too noisy age, serving as a channel, a medium for the sound of Sinai that had heretofore been shut out. And he was able to achieve this, not only because of his gifted mind and his eloquent tongue, but also because of his resplendent soul. In tradition, I noted that my favorite sermon of Rabbi Lamb was also a Kol Nidre composition. It is both lomdosh and lyrical, an hour-long shiur distilled into an astonishing sermon. Rabbi Lamb's subject was perhaps the most famous words in the Hebrew language, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And he illustrated that when we say hero Israel, we are, of course, repeating the mantra of Moshe, speaking to the nation of Israel, expressing the doctrine of our nation and the philosophical foundation of our faith, that God is one. 
But, he adds, according to the Talmud, the words of the Shema also recall not only a theological, but also a familial moment. When Yaakov Avinu was about to die, and his sons at his deathbed all in unison proclaimed their loyalty to his faith, speaking to the original Israel, Hear, O Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, your God is one in our heart. And therefore, he said, every Shema is both intellectual and emotional, national and personal, philosophical and familial. In reciting its opening sentence, we speak simultaneously to Israel, our nation, and to Yisrael, our forefather. Usually, he said in Shema, we are emphasizing first and foremost the doctrinal proclamation of Moshe. But on Yom Kippur, he said, we stand in our mind's eye at our father's deathbed once again, at the deathbed of Yaakov Avinu, as well as at the bedside of all of our ancestors who ask us to proclaim our loyalty to all that they pass down to us. Rabbi Lamb's description of what Shema means also summarizes what his sermons sought to accomplish to connect Klal Yisrael to God in a modern and agnostic age. Rabbi Lamb said, In calling out to him, Yisrael, across the chasm of the generations, we assure him and ourselves that the one God that he worshipped is ours as well, that we continue his tradition which he entrusted to his children, that we have not and will not falter as we strive to implement his kingdom of heaven in our own times and our own places that three and a half millennia later we still carry aloft our grandfather's torch of the unification of his name, and that we pledge to continue to do so even in an age of cynicism, confusion, and despair. In the end, every sermon of Rabbi Lamb was a Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, and it combined both versions of the Shema. He was intellectual and emotional, philosophical and familial. This was the source of his success. When he said implicitly to his audience, hear, O Israel. People heard because he ensured that they listened. And they listened, not because he flattered his audience, not because he told them what they wanted to hear, but rather because he showed them respect and the careful consideration of an exquisite and carefully crafted homiletical masterpiece. Examples of that today in the internet age are few and far between. They are painfully wanting in our world, and in the rabbinate as well. And so in a certain sense, as we pay tribute to Rabbi Lamb, we bid farewell not only to him, but to the oratorical age of Drush that he above all exquisitely embodied. For what Rabbi Lamb said on Yom Kippur so many years ago is even more true today. We live in an age of torrents of words, multitude of media. While it has become easier to communicate, That does not mean that we have become better at it. Rabbi Lamb reminds rabbis, and really anyone in a public position, that particularly when, in a digital medium, whatever we say and write can be preserved forever, it is our obligation to weigh every word and carefully fashion every phrase. And yet today, all too often, at every controversy, rabbis and other Jewish leaders might sometimes take to Twitter or foment on Facebook and express their opinions in a manner that we can perceive was not carefully composed. Rabbi Lamb reminds rabbis to communicate the Torah with a sense of reverence and responsibility. We mourn Rabbi Lamb and the loss is immense. In the internet age, the ability for instantaneous communication has ironically led to an even greater lack of listening a more profound sound of silence. To amend Simon's lyrics, ours is a world not so much of people talking without speaking, but of people posting without thinking. What Rabbi Lamb called human static has only increased. But there is also here inspiration and consolation. Rabbi Lamb's sermons are there to be read. The oratory of genius is there to be savored. And I, experience this again and again. And I can guarantee that as you read the words composed with so much care, then the sound of Sinai will make itself known. And for those who knew him, Rabbi Lamb's voice will also be heard again.
It is difficult to speak about my grandfather's Torah without simultaneously thinking about the exquisite privilege I had of being a bot by it in my grandparents' home for almost 40 years. My grandfather wrote and spoke about important topics of the day and taught me personally, my family, an extended family, our community, and the world at large, how to live as Jews and how to understand Jewish living. And while he was on the public stage, it was not just an act. I know that because I was privileged to have a front row seat at their table, and for that, I am beyond grateful. The topic that we'll explore today, his work about Tara HaMishpacha, the laws of family purity, entitled A Hedge of Roses, is, as we will see, a reflection of his philosophy regarding what the Jewish home can and should be. And I'm thankful to Hashem for the truly exceptional fortune of spending so much time in that home. A Hedge of Roses is actually often viewed as an apologetic work that my grandfather composed in the 1960s to promote the observance of the laws of Tahrat Mishpacha, which at that time were largely not observed in modern Orthodox circles. And it defends the laws of Tahrat Mishpacha by presenting specific ways in which they can enhance the marriage and by highlighting how their observance can ground the relationship in broader human and Jewish values. And one of the questions that I've thought a lot about in my capacity as a Yoetzet and as a college teacher in the past decade is, does this book still have a place on the bookshelf of a 2021 couple? Is there still a need for expositions on the laws of Tarat Mishpacha that can serve as motivations for observance? Are the questions that modern couples are contending with addressed by writing such as A Hedge of Roses? And this question can and should be addressed from a psychosocial and cultural perspective. Today, though, I would like to address the question of this work's relevance from a different angle, from the vantage point of Jewish thought. And this really requires a re-examination of this premise that it is merely a work of apologetics. And we'll do this by analyzing it in tandem with my grandfather's other writings, looking at it from a wide angle lens, and what we will see is that A Hedge of Roses is actually one of many expressions of my grandfather's broader philosophy about the role of Jewish law in protecting and safeguarding all human relationships. The linchpin of A Hedge of Roses, I believe, is actually really found in another sermon from 1967 entitled Love and Law from Parshat Kitete, and was subsequently republished in his work Seventy Faces. And there, he even invokes the Hedge of Roses image, which is strikingly absent from the book itself. And he writes, It is because of Judaism's concern for the integrity of marriage and home that it legislates on such matters. In fact, the more important the subject, the more does Judaism hedge it about with laws. It is because marriage is so sacred and sexuality is so sensitive that Torah prefers to protect it by law rather than wax poetical about it romantically. So here he suggests that law is necessary to guard relationships and that reliance on fickle emotions such as love is simply insufficient. To test this thesis, first we will explore some of his writings on marriage, and then we'll examine some sermons in which he discusses other relationships as well. In combing through the writings on marriage, I found at least five ways in which he believes that the presence of halacha serves to protect the relationship. In his sermon, Love and Law, he writes, Jewish law creates the conditions under which law can flourish in human relationships and under which people can live humanely with each other, even if they do not attain love. He quotes Ramban's interpretation of Yahafta Larecha Kamocha, one should love his neighbor like himself, as he does in many contexts, as an injunction to act lovingly towards one's neighbor, as opposed to love one's neighbor as himself. He essentially believes that law enters in to ensure that one's actions are appropriate and that they promote a sustained and moral relationship even in the absence of love. And this happens because halacha demands that we act in accordance with the value and not necessarily with the emotion of love. A second way that he suggests that law shields the marital bond is by enhancing the relationship and even restoring it to its emotional ideal through legislating loving actions. And this is very much in consonance with the principle of that feelings and thoughts 
follow actions. In his words, if I act lovingly, then a true love relationship will be built up. And after a while, it will not be mere role playing, but genuine. This idea actually dovetails with some of the specific benefits that he enumerates in A Hedge of Roses that can be accrued by observing the 11 or 12 day minimum days of separation. Specifically, that it helps the sexual relationship to remain vibrant and allows for the continuation of what he refers to as the perpetual honeymoon. In his words, the drama of love without sexual contact followed by the loving union of husband and wife. So, so far we've explored two ways that he believes that law protects love. First, it ensures that the couple treat each other appropriately. And second, it can even help to facilitate loving emotions. And his focus on the primacy of loving actions versus loving emotions is noteworthy in light of the numerous other places in his sermons where he addresses the fleeting nature of love. While he was writing and sermonizing in the 1960s culture of free love, it seems that his emphasis on this was not merely reactionary to the events and culture of his times. His writings are replete with reflections garnered from his pastoral experience on the lack of seriousness and romantic delusions with which couples approached marriage. And he shares that many were not entering marriages with the thought that this endeavor deserves because they were swept up in emotion. In A Hedge of Roses, he responds to the age-old challenge, can't I just create my own laws of separation and achieve the same goal? To which she replies, no voluntary separation can ever be as effective as one which is mutually accepted as religiously binding. It is this codified tradition, he says, this obligatory law that has bestowed the gift of stability upon the Jewish family. And while not everyone might experience this third suggestion for how law safeguards love, I believe that his point is that having halacha as a third party to lay down parameters is helpful in creating structure and stability by eliminating a lot of the negotiation that happens when it's just my approach versus your approach. In his words, it is this which facilitates the perpetuation of the Jewish home and thus the perpetuation of Jewish tradition. Finally, a fourth contribution of law, and in particular, of the many intricate details of marriage and divorce, is to remind the couple about the import and consequences of the marital relationship. So we've seen four reasons for how law safeguards love. It ensures appropriate interactions. It can even enhance the love in the relationship. It ensures stability, and it reminds us about the seriousness of the marital relationship. Let us now turn our attention to other of my grandfather's works, which demonstrate that he believed that law plays a critical role in the safeguarding of all relationships, not just marriage. The first example is local to the interpersonal relationship. In his sermon, Can I Love My Neighbor If I Hate Myself, from 1964, he presents the debate between Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai with regarding what the most central principle in the Torah is. Rabbi Akiva famously asserts that the Ahav de la Reha Kamocha, one should love his neighbor like himself, is most important. While Ben Azai objects and argues, no, Bidmut Elokim Asa Oto Zeh Klag all men are created in the image of God, is a greater principle than this. He explains the position of Ben Azai as follows. For were we to rely only on love thy neighbor as thyself, then a man might say, since I have been disgraced, let my fellow man be disgraced with me. Since I am accursed, let my fellow man be accursed. My grandfather observed that our emotions regarding ourselves are too flighty and fickle to guide interpersonal interactions. Loving a neighbor as one loves himself is therefore an unstable criteria for mandating interpersonal behavior. Therefore, he interprets Ben Azai's position to mean that the way in which we operate in the world at large, and certainly the way in which we treat others, must be based on a fixed principle that can weather all emotional storms. Hence the position of Ben Azai. A second example appears in The Makings of Man from Parshat Korach, 1961, where he extends his theory about the power of law as a protective mechanism to society at large. In discussing Korach's rebellion, he suggests that both rebelliousness and conformism are necessary personality traits. 
Regarding rebelliousness, he writes, rebellion implies a protest against stagnation, the promise of discovery, the quest for something new and more wholesome. Without the element of rebelliousness, the soul ceases to speak, the spirit is somber and silent as a cemetery. Regarding conformism, he writes, without conformism, there can be no love. For in love, the two lovers must conform to each other's wishes, needs, and demands. The conformist, by restraining his will, allows law to operate and order to prevail. Without conformism, there can be neither society nor government, neither halacha nor traffic regulation. So not only does he suggest that conformism is a prerequisite for functional relationships, but that it's necessary for the prevalence of order in society at large. There is a place for rebelliousness, for one to act based on passion. But alone, this creates chaos. Conformism, fidelity to fixed laws, sometimes even entailing the quashing of one's emotions, is critical for preserving order in society. So we've elaborated upon this thesis statement that appears in Love and Law by reviewing his works and exploring four ways in which law protects marriage. We've seen an example of how law protects other relationships, Ben Azai's position, Bidmut Elohim Asa'oto. And we've seen an example in his sermon about Korach, about how law protects society and about the value of conformism. The common thread that runs throughout is that emotion has two sides. It can create deep and powerful relationships, but can it also destroy if it is not balanced by law. In his words, without law, love conquers all, but also destroys all, including itself. This is true on all three levels of these relationships. So is a hedge of roses a mere work of apologetics? Does it have a rightful place in the library of today's couples? At the very least, from the vantage point of Jewish thought, of which my grandfather here, as always, draws on Torah as well as the best of secular wisdom, I believe it does. Viewed in the context of his canon, what really emerges is that a hedge of roses is a meditation on the supreme value of relationships in Jewish thought with a focus on the lengths to which halacha goes to safeguard particularly sacred and vulnerable relationships such as marriage. May we all merit to reap the benefits of the halachic parameters that hedge all of our various relationships and that ensure the functioning of society at large. And on a personal note, I pray to Hashem that myself and my family, who were privileged to have seats at my grandparents' table for so many years, can emulate the values that they taught us through creating the Lamb family home. To understand my grandfather, Mori Zakani, Rabbi Norman Lamb, Zechert Tzadik Levracha, you need to place yourself on a rocket ship. I don't mean that metaphorically, I actually have in mind a particular rocket ship, the Apollo 8 spacecraft. The astronauts aboard were the first humans ever to leave low orbit and the first to travel to the moon. And when they finally reached the moon, they were given the opportunity to broadcast a message back to the millions of people gathered around their television sets. And as humanity waited with bated breath, to hear man's first words spoken from above the celestial sphere. The voice of lunar module pilot Bill Anders crackled through the broadcast. We are now approaching lunar sunrise, and for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Anders eventually, followed by Jim Lovell and Commander Frank Borman, simply read the opening verses of Sefer Beratius, the book of Genesis. And so it was that at the very outset of my grandfather's prime, on December 24th, 1968, a mere five days after his 41st birthday, that my grandfather saw the literal fulfillment of the psalmist's declaration, Ashamayim Mesaprim Kvod Kel, Umase Yadav Magid Arakia, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. For thousands of years, 
Our people maintain the courage of our conviction that the Torah is essential wisdom for ensuring the moral excellence of humankind, but we had nearly always been telling this to ourselves. But here, at the very apex of human technological achievement, was an unparalleled demonstration of devotion to the tradition of which we are stewards. More than anything, this moment was a clarion call to the Jewish people to be worthy of the moment. How should we, the Jewish people, respond to a world that not only needed, but desired the guidance of our wisdom at a time in history when our people had unprecedented freedom to meet that desire? This was the question that captivated my grandfather throughout his life, and it runs through so much of what he taught over the course of many decades as a leading Jewish thinker. And in essence, my grandfather believed that in order to seize the opportunities of the moment, the Jewish people had three responsibilities. The first was that the Jewish people have a responsibility to listen. You know, I used to learn with my grandfather when I was in yeshiva and eventually in smicha. We learned through so many things together, but there was a time when he suggested that we learn hakdamos, introductions to famous works of Jewish thought, to famous svarim. Because it was in the introduction, he believed, that an author tells you what they really think. And he actually insisted that we start with a particular hakdama. You'd assume it'd be the introduction to Rav Hirsch's Chumash, or to a work by Rav Cook or Rav David Tzvi Hoffman. No. He insisted on beginning with the Hakdama to Vayoa Moshe, the quintessential anti-Zionist tract by the Satmar Rebbe. Why? I couldn't make heads or tails of it at the time. But I went back over my notes that I took while we were studying together a few months ago, and I noticed something that I jotted down. We're reading this vituperative attack on Zionists, on anyone who believes in secular learning, anyone who had patience for assimilated Jews, and so on. And I wrote something to the effect of, wow, he sounds like he's describing my grandfather. And I think that's why my grandfather wanted us to read this. My grandfather believed deeply and fully in the importance of listening, especially to those who might teach you something you didn't already know. Certainly my grandfather disagreed with the Satmar Rebbe, and he was implacably opposed to his anti-Zionism, and certainly the Satmar Rebbe thought people like my grandfather, in turn, were villains. But, as my grandfather believed, there is indisputable virtue for a Ben Bas Torah in listening and learning, even in the face of stark difference, or especially in the face of stark difference. And this principle, of course, is critical for understanding the idea for which my grandfather was perhaps best known, Torah Umada. Torah Umada, after all, is fundamentally an exercise in listening for the reverberating echo of the Creator's voice in every corner of his creation. As my grandfather put it in a landmark address on the concept of Torah Umada, A new appreciation of a Beethoven symphony or a Cezanne painting or the poetry of a Milton can move us to greater sensitivity to the infinite possibilities of the creative imagination with which the Creator endowed his Tzalem Alakim. So the first responsibility incumbent upon the Jew in this dispensation is to listen. But listening alone is insufficient. In fact, it's cowardly, reflecting a belief that deep down we have nothing to add ourselves. The student of Torah has much to learn from others, yes, but has tenfold as much to teach. And as my grandfather relentlessly emphasized for decades, all of society, the lofty and downtrodden alike, desperately needs the Torah's wisdom as well. The Torah, as my grandfather understood, is civilization's best hope. It represents the greatest, grandest moral tradition in the history of humanity. And without the Torah, my grandfather warned, during the turbulent summer of 1953, we all become, in his words, easy prey for any cruel ism which can tyrannize the empty souls of ignorant children, from atheism to communism to materialism. And so in this era, the Jew is not only a responsibility to listen, but a responsibility to teach. And this has, after all, always been our role in the history of moral development. My grandfather put it magnificently in a sermon from Parshas Korach in 1964, one of my favorites. He asked, What is the prophetic tradition if not the expression of a revolutionary character? It had its genesis in Abraham, 
who was an iconoclast. It reached its heights in Moses, who defied Pharaoh and both the military might and cultural hegemony of Egypt. For three and a half thousand years, my grandfather said, Judaism has been out of step with the world and has thus managed to be its repository of sanity and sanctity. Yes, we Jews bear a divine obligation to teach the world as best we can, to model kindness and compassion, virtue and justice, and my grandfather believed the Torah's jurisdiction extended into every realm of human existence. You know, there's this infuriating tick you find in contemporary Judaism where people in the pews insist that rabbis shouldn't talk politics. Yaharig val yavor. My grandfather, by contrast, believed that this was a theologically untenable position. If you take religion seriously, if it actually means something, then it has to speak to the most urgent questions that arise in the course of human events. It has to. And in some of his earliest addresses as a young pulpit rabbi, my grandfather had already articulated this conviction. Commenting on the Korean War peace talks in a sermon in Parshas Vayishlach, delivered just two weeks shy of his 25th birthday, a young Rabbi Norman Lamb proclaimed, Now it is not the business of a rabbi to comment on purely political or diplomatic matters, but when matters of principle are involved, then the people have the right to know what the teachers of religion have to say about the burning issues of our time. When the propaganda machines have ceased their loud clattering and the din of partisan shouting has been silenced, the still small voice of religion must make known its moral and spiritual judgment. And over the course of his career, my grandfather proved this dictum many times over, teaching both our own community and the wider society at large, Judaism's unique perspective on a variety of issues, from teaching how Judaism understands racism as the crime of idolatry to defining Judaism's approach to ecology, to assessing Jewish thought's distinct perspective on everything from the hippies to the threat of communism. Jews ultimately have a sacred obligation not only to listen, but to teach. And finally, my grandfather felt that Jews had a third responsibility in this age, a responsibility to maintain a sense of Jewish dignity. I think he expressed it best in a sermon from 1970 called Confessions of a Confused Rabbi. He delivered it two weeks after the Kent State shootings, and it was shortly after the beginning of America's Cambodian campaign. And in that sermon, my grandfather related that young people in his congregation had approached him to ask why he hadn't addressed those events right after they occurred. And he confessed that he felt conflicted. On the one hand, he was outspoken against the Vietnam War, and he considered the Kent State shootings, in his word, a blot on the history of our nation. And yet, he explained, he couldn't go all the way with the zealous student activists, campus activists of the day, particularly in their support for the new Black Panthers. As he thundered from the pulpit, the Black Panthers are not our friends. They are anti-Semites and they are anti-Israel. I would like to see young Jews who seek justice for the Black Panthers and more power to them in their passion for justice, oppose these pernicious anti-Semites with equal zeal. And he continued, I have nothing but contempt for the so-called universal Jew who makes every people's concern his own, save that of his own people. So in sum, my grandfather instructed us to listen with an open heart to the perspectives of others. He charged us to bring the Torah out into the world around us. And he cautioned us never to forget our Jewish self-respect when we engage with society. I began my remarks on a rocket ship, so I suppose it's only fair that we end on one as well. And this one that reached the public consciousness at the very end of my grandfather's prime in February 2003. It was in that moment that the world bore witness to the death of Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli astronaut in space. So here was a secular Jew, non-observant, who nevertheless took his Judaism with the utmost seriousness. In fact, he brought a Torah a Torah that had survived the horrors of Bergen-Belsen, into space with him. If 35 years earlier, Jews could merely watch, albeit with appreciation and admiration, if still righteous envy, as others proclaimed God's glory from the heavens, then by 2003, as my grandfather's public career drew to a close, it was our turn. In his eulogy for Ilan Ramon, my grandfather recognized the shift. He said, like Moses who went up to receive the Torah and bring it down to the people of Israel, so to Ilan Ramon went up, bringing the Torah of Moses to display to his people on earth. My grandfather was enormously blessed to begin to see, by the end of his prime, the potential fulfillment, the Reshit Smichat Gulateinu, 
of his dream for the Jewish people to be active participants in the drama of history. Humble listeners, confident teachers, and proud sovereign Jews. And if anything, we're living in a time that's even more hospitable to his vision than any time in Jewish history. The opportunities, the necessity for Jewish moral leadership in this age are more apparent and urgent than ever before. And if we are to be true stewards of the legacy of Rabbi Norman Lamb, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, then let us commit ourselves in the days and years ahead to fulfilling the exalted words of the prophet Isaiah. Ki mitzion teitzei Torah, udvar Hashem Yerushalayim. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. May my grandfather's memory be a blessing for our community and all of Klal Yisrael. This evening, you have heard great presentations about the scope and depth of Rabbi Norman Lamb's intellectual, spiritual, and educational contributions to the Jewish people and our broader society throughout his incredible career as rabbi, scholar, community leader, and institutional visionary. Talks about his darshanut, philosophy, character, and worldview have broadened and deepened our understanding of his inspiring accomplishments. As someone who has sat in his seat as both rabbi of the Jewish Center and president of Yeshiva University, and who has a deep understanding of the constraints and demands that were naturally on his time, I am simply overawed by his prodigious achievements as a scholar, writer, and teacher. They speak to his brilliance, and erudition, as well as his passion and purpose. Rabbi Lamb passed away right after the holiday of Shavuot, when we commemorate Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. The great medieval sage Ramosha ben Nachman the Ramban explains that there's a special mitzvah to not only remember the content of Matan Torah, but the form as well. Raki shamer lecha ushmor nafshecha ma'od, you should remember and never forget what you saw with your own eyes on the day that you stood at Har Sinai in Chorev. According to the Ramban, the significance of Mam at Har Sinai was not just the truth that was communicated in the commandments and teachings at Sinai, but the experience of Sinai, the lights, the fire, the sounds, the fear, the glory, the way God chose to articulate the commandments must also be remembered. Being a student of Rabbi Lamb was a Sinai-like experience, both enlightening and inspiring, informed, and content. In my hesped for him, I likened Rabbi Lamb to both an artist and an architect. As the premier expositor of our community's worldview, Rabbi Lamb was a rabbinic artist. He was the most articulate, eloquent, compelling speaker in the Jewish world. For Rabbi Lamb, the speech was a work of art. Every word was selected, every moment chosen. In my years as a young rabbi, I would regularly meet with him in his office in his apartment, and he would impart to me his Torah and life lessons with careful attention on creating a compelling experience. Cadence, rhythm, beat created a music to his words, which carried and elevated all who heard him. Rabbi Lamb's mastery was otherworldly. Everyone loved his talks, but they did not truly understand why. He was playing in another dimension that people did not even know existed. But Rabbi Lamb was not simply an artist. He was also an architect. His vast intellect and penetrating scholarship, bringing together sources from all fields of knowledge, anchored modern life into our values and taught us how we can grow from the interchange of history's great ideas. The ideas he invented, the concepts he clarified, the phrases he coined became part of the Jewish landscape and lexicon of the day. Spiritual dignity, sensuous orthodoxy, moderation, synthesis, and Torah omada. He created the Jewish conceptual, spiritual, and moral scaffolding that enabled our community 
to succeed and thrive as Torah Jews in the modern era. Samuel Taylor Coleridge famously said that the principle of Gothic architecture is infinity made imaginable. This is what Rabbi Lamb did for us. He translated the infinity, the Torah, wisdom, truth, into the imaginable in terms and concepts and ideas we can understand and appreciate and into institutions and communities that would perpetuate them. As an artist, Rabbi Lan inspired us to soar to the heavens. As an, as an architect, he brought heaven down to us. Rabbi Lam's enormous success as president of Yeshiva University all stemmed from this core belief in the power of ideas to shape an institution and change a world. He transformed our institution into his canvas, perpetuating and institutionalizing his vision which inspired great philanthropists to donate their resources, great rabbis and academicians to partner in the project, and generations upon generations of students to be shaped by his values and ideals. The Talmud explains that every grandfather who teaches his grandchild Torah continues the revelation of Sinai. Amr Rabbi Shua Malevi, Kaw Malame, Det Benbeno Torah, Mala la Bakatov ki ilu, Kibla mehar Sinai. Shanamar va datan lovenacho vene benecha, the Samachle yom asha amarata lufne hashem lokecha, the Chori. Rabbi Shua Malevi says, Anyone who teaches his grandson Torah, the verse ascribes him credit as though he received it from Mount Sinai. And he quotes, the Gemara quotes this Pasuk that you should make it known to your sons and your son's sons, which is juxtaposed to the phrase, the day when you stood before the Lord your God in Choreth. And this is the third way in which hearing and studying Rabbi Lamb's words is a Sinai-like experience. It's the form, it's the content, but also the endurance. That will not just be the first generation, of those who heard him directly, who will study his words. But it will be the grandchildren, or grand Talmidim, the next generation, who will continue to find meaning and inspiration in his Torah and wisdom. Tonight's program, reflecting the depth and breadth of Rabbi Lam's teachings, is a reflection of this aspect. Rabbi Lam's memory will endure every time we study and cite his words. Rabbi Lamb's memory will endure every time we confront the timely and challenging issues of our time with courage and compassion. Rabbi Lamb's memory will endure every time we articulate the resounding message of Torah in a way that respects and elevates all who are participants in the conversation. Rabbi Lamb will endure because we, his students, who have been shaped by him, continue his work and perpetuate his legacy. Tehei Nishmato Baruch. May his memory be for a blessing.